Three, two. I got everybody pregnant with Barry Katz and semen. I'm not comfortable with the tone this is taking. If you're undeniable, you will not be denied. If you want to be successful in show business, you get yourself a Jew white manager like Barry Katz. <laughs> Being a manager is just turning no's into yeses. Creating holy shit moments. Uh, undeniable. You fucking firing me up, Katz. I love this man. Is there anything else I should know? You're on. What? Now I'm on the air. Harry Katz. Back in the house. 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 Let's do this. Do this. Ladies and gentlemen, a guy I've known for a little while now, and I I love this guy. Please welcome, what an honor, Zach Gordon. Wow. I, I feel very honored. The feeling is mutual and grateful to be here chatting with you. And as you know, we've had many wonderful conversations over dinner on set. And now the, the people, the world get to get to hear the scoop uh, strictly from you and maybe me if they'd like to. So, Well, it's all about you. It's, <laughs> it, there's nothing about me. It's just all about you. Oh, come on. You know, it's an even playing field here. You fascinate me because you're in a rare area of an artist in the sense that you figured out the craft, you figured out how to win, you figured out how to make a difference probably before you even figured out puberty, figured out what it was like to be a man, what it was like to have responsibilities. And so it's very rare when somebody becomes extraordinary at something or is extraordinary at something before they even have their 10,000 hours. And then what happens is for all of us, we change as human beings physically. You know, when we're 13, 14 and 15 or 16, we look different than we did or do when we're 24 or 25 or 26 or in my case, 97. <laughs> um, so, and you're in a medium, you're working in a medium where it's a visual medium. People identify with people they love and they keep coming back to see people they love because they identify with them. And throughout time, they age. So there's an unbelievable challenge as an artist who figures it out when they look completely different 10 years later and the audience has to rally around them there and you have to figure out a way to get them to love you when you're that age and that look too, it's almost next to impossible. They have to figure out a way to recalibrate and make it happen. And, and having just done a movie with you, which was uh, really wonderful, Max Dagan, where you were the title role, uh, clearly uh, you haven't forgotten any of your skill set. But I think it's important because you're like one of the few people in the world, you could count them, honestly, you could count them on maybe a ha uh, two hands, maybe two feet, the people who became household names and well-known. And then, hey, I love this career. Okay, I'm moving on. Well, who you're coming into audition, but who are you again? Yeah, I'm Zach, I'm Zach Gordon. Oh, Zach, I'm sorry, I didn't really recognize you. you I just remembered you from the, from the Wimpy Kid movies. I'm I don't sorry. remember you having a mustache at 11 years old. You just, you look different now. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I know it's a long rambling thing that I gave you, but I think you're uniquely qualified to answer it, and it's something that very few people have experienced. One of the things I love about you, Barry, <laughs> is you truly know how to speak in a way that is articulate, thoughtful, and passionate. 
And I really appreciate that about you. And I just wanted to recognize that and say that I couldn't have described my own uh, career puberty better than you did. <laughs> And so I think when you say unique, maybe I'm the only one in history who's gone through puberty a couple of times uh, in different ways. But even you talking about it, it makes me realize that I've never genuinely been able to process it fully. I, I, I take time to sit with my thoughts. I, I like to think I'm also thoughtful and articulate and and calculated when it comes to speaking on things that I still don't feel qualified enough to talk about. <laughs> when will I give myself the credit for it? Because yeah, I grew up in a way that there is no how to deal with fame at a young age and fit in and also try to figure out if what you're doing is what you actually want to do with your life. There's no book, there's no biography, and there's certainly not a lot of empathy. And that's not saying I need it. I think I'm stronger for feeling like I didn't have it, but that doesn't make it easy. And I turned 26 in seven days. I've been realizing that I've been going through another puberty. And that puberty this time is letting go of everything I thought I knew. And not in the sense that I don't know a lot, but in the sense that I am transitioning into a fully fledged adult now. I'm not a kid. I want to be a kid. I want to hold on to my youth. A lot of the people that I meet identify me as this character, this hero, this, uh, I like to think hero, but this, this idealized version of a person that maybe I was for a time, maybe I still am, parts of me are, but who, regardless of if I want to continue to explore that part of me, is not entirely who I am anymore. The, uh, the youthful, naive um, fearlessness that I had as an 11 12 year old who only had to worry about what type of candy he was going to eat after he rapped on set that had to that had i think he died early on and it wasn't because he wanted to it was just a part of growing up and so i think when you say the way i grew up is unique i have to agree with you but i, I feel like i'm still going through the same changes and asking myself the the ultimatums that we all do which is what do i want to do why am I doing it? And where do I see myself in the next, I don't know, three, five, 10 years? And I think because things had always been decided for me at a young age, whether that was with the help of my mom, with the support of a team, being on set, telling me where to stand, what lines to say, I feel like growing up, the only challenge truly was why am I not feeling like I fit in? And not because I consciously understood that, but the same way that when I meet somebody, they automatically have an opinion about me. They like me for the work that I've done, or they hate me for the work that I've done, for things that I have no control over. Or maybe they already have a judgment based off of the things they've heard about me. There's no going into a situation like middle school or high school thinking that you're just going to be a fly on the wall and everyone's going to treat you like you're the average Joe. I, I always felt like a, not to quote Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, but I always felt like a, a, a guy gene is what they call an outsider in that movie. Um, and I, I just was too young to understand that I was always going to be an outsider. And that's not something that I'm resentful about. Maybe for a time I was because I didn't understand it. Just like I'm still trying to understand the fact that I'm entering a new stage in my life, right? It's it's always the catching up part that is the difficult the difficult part. And so to answer your question, I think that the biggest challenge up until now, up until recently is I I never went with it. I always I always battled it. I battled the fact that yeah, I was in movies as a kid. Most of my friends were adults, not because that's a a, a healthy relationship or there's anything wrong with them, but because when you're on a film set, for four months as a 13 year old, naturally your maturity level ideally gravitates towards the people that you are around constantly. And I even think now, uh, I mean, you claim you're 97 years old. I claim I'm 110 at times. So I, I'd say, you know, we're two peas in a, in a pod. But at, at the same time, I feel like I'm, I'm actually struggling more to, to discover that 
that youth, not because it's uh, something that I'm trying to hold on to, but I think it was a testament to why I worked so much when I was younger. And for whatever reason, the, the I don't want to say the con of it, but the repercussions of taking on such a role that I didn't understand at the time and then trying to continue and further my career, but also not knowing who I am and then constantly being affected by what people think about me. Because when you don't know who you are and everyone has an opinion about who you are, it's hard to really figure out what the heck is going on. And so I think now it's like, how do I tap into that fearlessness that I had without being so self-conscious, which again, I think most actors are, you almost have to be, especially in today's world where you say the wrong thing or you do the wrong thing or you take the wrong role and maybe people have short attention spans, but that doesn't mean that sometimes the rumor travels faster than the actual accolades or, or the, 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 the foundation that you've built for yourself. And so it's weird when you live in a world where it's hard enough to figure out who you are, let alone when everyone's telling you what you are, when you're also trying to tell other people what you are to try to fit in the box that they've created. So not to ramble on myself, but I feel like it's something that I'm still learning to navigate as I'm navigating new chapters in my life. But I think the one thing that I've come down to is trying to find peace within the fact that I'm not going to please everybody. And maybe that's something that is part of the industry that we're in, but I don't know if it's self-serving in the journey of who is Zach now and who does Zach want to be and the people that have grown up with Zach, how do they see him and, and how can they also hold on to the integrity of who he was, but also enjoy, I like to think, the authenticity and, and the excitement of what's to come. All right. So answer the three questions. I want you to interview yourself. You have the three questions you always ask yourself. You said it right at the beginning of that ramble. How do you answer those three questions? I don't want to stand on a soapbox here and say every adolescent or every young adult should ask themselves because it's certainly not something that I adopted. It's something that I think was handed down to me, if you could say handed down loosely. Um, look at me constantly justifying what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, the three questions being, who are you? What do you want? And where do you want to go? And I think that's obviously a really scary thing to sit down and, and try and answer, let alone ask. And I think even here, I'm, the gears are turning, the wheels are spinning. Who am I? And I think in a lot of ways, who are we is basically where we've been, the relationships we've had, the experiences we've had, and, and in a lot of ways, obviously, film being a huge part of my life. So I think roughly, if I can say this, um, you know, I'm obviously an actor, I'm an artist, I'm a, and I'm an emotional creature, highly emotional, um, and very introspective. And I also think, I like to think empathetic. I think, especially after training in a, an acting technique called the Meisner technique, what you learn is how to constantly listen to people and respond based off of what they're giving you. And emotionally is how you respond. Um, so I think that's definitely helped me be a great listener. So anyone who's looking for a, a long-term partner out there, my application is, uh, is, is currently being submitted anyway. Um, what do I want? Okay. So I think I, this, this sounds, I don't want to say counterintuitive, but maybe not what people would expect. I want a partnership. I don't know what that means. That could be a business partnership. It ideally would be a romantic one. I think uh, it's tough these days. Uh, so you're you're one of the few men in society who's 25 or 26 that wants to settle down with a partner and some and 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 have a, that kind of thing as opposed to just experiencing different relationships in the next five or ten years. I want to say yes and no, because partnership has shifted for me, not in the sense that it does mean to me raising a family, you know, having a partner I can trust, support, rely on, vice versa, ideally. You want a family. I do. I, I mean, I, I'd like to think it's one of my main purposes, if not the main purpose. Um, I think my family is going to have a longer lasting impact than... I mean, most of my work will. Not to say that it won't have an impact, but I think that's the impact when I go to sleep at night that I, I feel really solid about. 
You know, careers go up and down, as you know. Uh, culture changes, you know, all the greats that I, I like to think I still watch, the Cary Grants of the world. I don't know how many people my age know anybody named Cary. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, it's just one of those things where he was the biggest star of his time. And my generation, I'd say 99% have no idea who he is. And that's not to say it's right or wrong. It's just, it's just a fact. And so if I, I know that I could be in the biggest Marvel movie of all time and most likely in a hundred years, no one's going to know. That doesn't mean my impact didn't matter, have a great influence, but my family is going to be responsible and hopefully ideally want to uh, carry on that legacy. Now, to answer your question about the partnership, I know what it takes to be in a healthy relationship, healthy meaning two people, in my opinion, uh, attending to each other's needs. How do you know what it's like? I mean, I've been in a handful, and I also think I've... Uh, so you've been in relationships that worked tremendously well and flawlessly, and then you had... I know where you're going with this. So I would say definitely not flawlessly, and I think that's where my growth has come. Were you the flaw or were they the flaw? I think me saying I was not the flaw in any of those relationships would be a complete lie. And I think that's one of the challenges I'm facing when it comes to... I don't want to say dating. I could even be a friendship, frankly. I mean, I think all relationships are just a different side of the spectrum. Uh, You know, romantically, uh, casually, friendship way, it all takes communication. It all takes willing to admit where you can grow, what you might have done wrong and not wrong in the sense that you should beat yourself up about it, but what you can do better. And also, I think the key is thinking about how your actions affect the other. And so now when I'm moving into this next stage of my life and I want a partnership, well, what am I doing to deserve that partnership? And I think that one of the biggest lessons I've learned from my, I like to say, I'm not an expert on relationships, far from it, you know? Look at this 25-year-old kid talking about how he wants a partnership. Well, I think what I do know is I know what it takes to have a healthy relationship. And by healthy, I mean somebody who feels like they're heard, supported, appreciated, respected. I want those same things. But I also know that where I'm at in my career right now and the things that I need to pay my uh, respects and attention to, meaning my music, my acting, even my family and their health. Do I have the time to properly invest in a partner? Uh, probably not, although it's something that I really want. And so I think that's the shift that's happened for me is knowing that I could in I could voluntarily be a part of this casual culture that we have. Maybe it's been around for longer than just what feels like my generation. But I think that now knowing what I do know, letting go of that naive fearless, youthful, maybe selfish part of me. It's not saying all those things aren't still there, but I think as you mature, I like to think, um, and you get older and you start to realize, well, a relationship isn't just about you. Uh, it's hard to go back and pretend that you don't know these things that you've learned. And and especially when it comes to thinking about how the other person would feel about the things that you, like, right? Like, is it fair to me if I know that my career is my priority right now? Not because I don't want a family or I want a partnership, but because I know what window I have to invest in my career for X amount of years till X amount of goals I want to achieve are accomplished. Now, is that fair to get into a partnership with somebody that I know needs an amount of respect, amount of attentiveness, amount of care, amount of support? I can try to do it all, but maybe I'd be resentful. And that's not fair to them. That's not their problem. And so as difficult as it is, it's it's one of these things where I'm wrestling with how can I find a partner also knowing that I can't give everything And what type of partner is willing to be able to reciprocate that, understand that, and maybe work with me on that? And I'm having trouble. That's not to say I'm perfect, but I know that having grown up in the limelight, having grown up around adults my whole life, it forced me to mature a lot faster or not, I would like to say, forced me to decide if I want to mature. And so I think, again, being thrown into these circumstances where I was never going to fit in and then having to navigate, well, I can keep trying to fit in with the people that I know I'm not going to fit in, or I can actually keep following the path that seems to be presented in front of me, which is I'm constantly around adults. I'm working on film sets. I'm, I'm a musician. I do comedy. I, there's all these things that I can grab onto, but yet for some reason I'm trying to, you know, think that maybe I should just, you know, swipe on dating apps and hang out with friends and go to college. And that's fine. That's great. But for some reason it feels like I'm, I'm stepping away from the path that's been presented to me. And so it's just this constant challenge, this constant struggle of, I want to be normal. I feel normal. I am normal. I'm not better or worse than anybody else. But for some reason, the things that I desire and the things that I'm passionate about don't seem to be things that 
a lot of the peers that I've talked with recently, and granted, I live in a bubble in Los Angeles, uh, I feel like an outsider sometimes. So that's just where I'm at. I'm still figuring things out, but I also know it's my job not to dump that on a partner. Uh, and so it's kind of like when it happens, it happens, and I definitely want it to happen, but I also need to make sure that I am a good partner too. And maybe that's when the person will reveal themselves. So rambled a bit, but... Okay, and, yeah. the th and the third question. Third question. Where do I see myself one, three, five, ten years? Or more. Or more. <laughs> hmm. You're doing my homework for me. Thank you. This is, our, this is wonderful. I feel like I always wanted to be a movie star, right? What does a movie star mean? And that's the question that I've had to You answer. always wanted from what age? From the moment I was on film sets. I mean, you could say nine, ten. I was the guy that, I mean, I used to, when I was two years old, Barry, there, my mom has videos of me dancing to Michael Jackson's Thriller music video. Like I'm watching the video and I'm dancing and I'm trying to copy them and I'm, and I'm just trying to make people laugh. I was always just... I don't know if it was I wanted people to like me. I don't think it was that. I think it was I always wanted to either be the center of attention or connect with somebody on more than just a mundane, casual level. I don't know what it was, but it was not something I questioned either. I knew that I was supposed to be on film sets. When I was doing Diary of Wimpy Kid, I mean, I, I wasn't like, I'm not supposed to be here. So you're saying your first day on the set, you just walked on like it was like breathing. I was breathing. I, I, I wasn't thinking about anything. So in other words, there was it was just like, I belong here. I don't know where the camera's pointing. I don't know where I'm supposed to stand, what I'm supposed to hold, but I'm I'm not nervous about anything. I'm I belong here. Not only did I belong here, and this is what I meant by referring to that fearlessness that I had that I think as you go through puberty and start to become aware of the opposite sex and trying to convince people to like you, I think that gets challenged quite a bit for everybody. Um, the world becomes very sobering. But I think when I was that age, I would walk on set and the only thing I'd think about is what are my lines, where am I saying them, and what time is craft service because I know I'm going to want some candy in a couple of hours. And I think that everything else around me was irrelevant. I mean, it's not even, it, it didn't even, it was like I had a shield, not consciously. There was a shield and you could throw anything at it and it would bounce off. There was nothing getting through because I already knew what I was doing. I knew what I was supposed to do and anything else would just probably get in the way of the time that I did have to socialize or hang out with friends or again, watch some TV and, and have a, a bowl of sugary cereal. <laughs> awesome. So keep going with the vision of the future. So I think that when I think about where I want to be in one, three, five, ten years, it changes. And I think that's just because there's so much change happening constantly within me. I always used to want to be a movie star, right? But then that changed when I realized that if I wanted to be a certain type of movie star, and, and people have to define that, right? What does movie star mean? Does it mean the most famous actor? Does it mean the most respected actor? Does it mean you're in movies? Because technically I was a movie star as a kid. So, you know, I, I starred in the movie we just did. What does that mean? And I think answering that for me has been less about being the most famous person and more about feeling like the work that I do matters and that I'm still upholding a level of integrity, artistry, and respect for the people around me, for myself, and ideally the craft that I claim to love so much. And I think the amount of work that I put into the projects, because again, it's not about what I say I'm gonna do, it's about like what I'm doing, and I think even the film that we just did was, an, I think it proved to me that I do want this, and I'm willing to die for it, I'm willing to injure myself for it, which is that healthy, I don't know, that's still something I'm wrestling with, but I think that, has been the first question is, what do I want? Well, if I want to be a movie star, where do I see myself in a couple of years? I don't need to be Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt. I mean, you could also argue the age of movie stars over. There's so much content. Um, you know, everything's just being thrown on a wall and we're seeing what hits. And so I also think that there's a lot more involved in that process than we're going to hire the dude that studied and did theater for 10, 20 years. And that's not something I did. But I think, you know, 
industries change, decisions change, the people making those decisions change. And there's a lot more factors than just Zach's a nice guy, you know? There's ticket sales, there's politics, there's uh, there's people that work for the company that have to be fed. So I think when you factor in all those things and things that I don't have control over, I've had to come to terms with the fact that I can just study as much as I want and be the best actor I can be. And I have no control over me being the next, you know, we've talked about Nightwing was always a dream of mine, you know? I, I'd love to play those roles. I think I would do very well. I'm sure a lot of other actors would too. Now. All I can really do is make sure that the work I am doing on the opportunities that are being presented to me is the best that it is. I am professional, I'm easy to work with, I make your job easier, and in fact, maybe I add other things. I like to think that my uh, my experience of 20 years of being on a set is an asset. I mean, again, I don't know why this isn't a job interview. The point is, I had to answer what being a movie star meant to me, and it wasn't what I always thought it meant. Now, the next thing is I'm a musician. I'm a singer, I'm a songwriter, I play guitar. And I'm finishing an EP right now, uh, six songs. And ideally, I'm going to have that out in the next six months. And so I think that's a new avenue. That's a new place for me to explore. Who knows? Maybe in a couple of years, I'll write a film where I'm starring in it, acting, playing music, all these things that I never thought I could do, but not because I wasn't given the opportunity, but because I just never said, you know what? I'm not going to wait for someone to teach me how to play guitar and sing. I'm just going to do it, hone the skill myself and... I'm gonna be probably be a better person for it. So again, where do I see myself? Not to dodge the question and go into all these side tangents. Hopefully, I'm continuing to work with people that really care about the work that they're doing. They're respectful, they're professional. They they admire the work of the James Deans, you know, the Jimmy Stewarts, um, the people that came before us who set the foundation and they wanna honor those people. Um, and then I think musically, it's just touring, performing, meeting the people that take the time to listen to my music, support me, and um, and hopefully traveling the world. And maybe there's a partner in that world, you know? But I think, uh, I think right now it's hard to envision it because I'm still figuring out who the hell Zach Gordon is, you know? One of the things that's fascinating, because I, I don't know you, obviously, as well as you know you, but I've... I don't, you know me pretty well, Barry. I... From the moment I met you, I think I really tapped into things about you. And there's things that I want to explore with you for the people listening who go through these things as an artist. Because I think this is really fascinating. It might not be fascinating for you, but uh, I think it'll be fascinating for the audience and, and for me. So when you first walked on the set of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, you're like... It's the greatest time of my life. I I'm I belong here. I walk on, I'll do a scene. I'm not even worried about the fact that did the director get it? Did my did I do a good job or whatever? I'm I I am this character. I'm making it happen. I I, I the world put it all on my shoulders, everybody on set. I'm 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 gonna make this happen. You probably had co-stars of yours that were coming up to you. Hey, uh, listen, Zach, I, I think I'm really tanking it. Could you just, I'm, I'm really getting in my head here. Could you help me? Yeah, no problem. Sit down, just be strong. Know your choices. Feel comfortable and confident. Go for it. And then slowly as your career goes, Zach, in my perception of you, and you could tell me if I'm wrong, you start becoming the normal artist, the artist who has fear, the artist who has anxiety, the artist who's twisted up in knots wondering if they're making the right choice. God, I did that audition. Should I do it again? I've got it on tape. Let me, let me try it a different way. Let me give it a little bit of, let me interpret this way or whatever. Even when you're on set, it's like, am I, am I, am I, am I doing okay? Is it, you know, am I, am I, you know, do I still have a job? Am I like, what? So I want to know at what point did you notice in your life that you went from the artist that's abnormal, the one that is oblivious to anything except just going in and giving it everything they have and, and feeling great and believing in themselves to getting to a point where 
you have feelings sometimes of anxiety, sometimes of self-doubt, sometimes of fear, um, a lack of belief in your talent and your gift, um, a, a feeling like, is it ever going to happen the way I want it to happen? When does the shift happen for you, like in your, in your life as an actor? Like, when did you go from, I'm f***ing invincible here, everybody, not saying it, but you just walk on the set and it's like, people know, hey, eh? like he's, we don't have to worry about him, you know? And, and how does it shift? And what point in your career did you notice a shift to where you became, what I like to say, a normal artist? I think the shift started when I went back to school and I noticed a shift. I noticed people started treating me differently. And even my teachers were speaking differently. And it wasn't something that I consciously clocked. It was just something that was sort of there. And I think it only amplified. I mean, like I said earlier, I feel like I've been through a, a, a lot of different types of puberty, <laughs> emotionally, physically. That's an incredible uh, thing. You don't, I don't want you to lose your place. It's one of the things that I don't really think about. So it's one thing in school when you get the movie and you're shooting on the movie and you bring a few friends to the set here and there or whatever, but... The rest of the school has no real understanding of what's happening until the movie comes out. Then the movie comes out, and that's what I... Don't lose your place. That's what I want to hear about inserted here as to... Things change when you're working and people know you're working, whatever, but when they actually see the movie, what was that week or month like in school after the movie came out? I mean, was that insanity or was it harder or was it easier or did you try to ignore it all? Like what I'm trying to ask you is like, you're saying it all changed when you went back to school, but you're the f***ing man. You're in a hit movie. I mean, it's like the, there's, there's, there's girls hanging off of you that never gave you the time of day. There's teachers who treated you like sh that are like, oh, uh, Zach, uh, just keep, don't worry about the homework. You can pass it in tomorrow. So how would that make you feel more fear, more anxiety, more whatever? I would think that would give you more confidence. Hey, everybody. It's Barry Katz, and I wanted to talk to you about Blueprint for Success. This is a community that I put together during the pandemic to help all artists of every walk of life in the entertainment business, no matter where you are in that part of this journey, it's designed to help you. There are podcasts with people that will inspire you like Kevin Hart, Judd Apatow, Bill Burr that you can't find anywhere else but on this program that I've interviewed to times where we get to talk to executives in the business that you would never have access to, to tell you what you need to hear and to answer your questions to all sorts of different videos and master classes designed to help you get to the promised land. That's what the blueprint for success is. Doesn't matter whether you want to be a stand-up comedian, a sketch performer, a podcaster, an actor, an actress, director, writer, social media person, whatever you want to be. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've had the honor and been humbled to represent people like Chappelle, Wanda Sykes, Louis C.K., Dane Cook, and probably over 20 other people who went from a studio apartment to being a multi-millionaire and a household name. And I want that for you, and I want to take the time with this program to be able to help you on your way there, to get there and to heighten and increase the trajectory of your career. Blueprint for success is the way to go. 
I'm proud to be a part of this program, and I'd be proud to have you to be a part of it too. See, Barry, that's the <laughs> misconception. When I say people treated me differently, I, th I think most people immediately jump to more attention from the opposite sex, teachers, an easier life. I felt like I got the opposite more. I felt like people were mean to me. People were judgmental and things were said about me. I mean, not, I mean, when I'm in seventh grade, nothing was really said about me. I just mean in the sense that like, people talk about you more. I was the type of guy that loved wearing sweatpants and I think I wore, sweatpants every day even in the heat of the summer for like a month and when people start really paying attention to you they it's like they find anything to talk about and I remember people were bullying me because I wore sweatpants so you got bullied after the movie came out yeah I mean Barry they they called like they called me the wimpy kid which wasn't a big deal to me but a lot of the guys truly were trying to get under my skin you know they call me wimpy and all this stuff and like it didn't really bother me but then when you start getting to a point where you want to be maybe a little cooler for the girls and want to be looked at as a, a strong <laughs> growing man not a, a you know a skinny wimpy kid which again I wasn't but it started so to the really movie seep hurt in. you it didn't hurt me it felt like it hurt me because when I didn't really know who I was and I was changing constantly every month, my nose grew, my my hair got way longer, like my eyes got beady. I mean, it took like five years just for my head to catch up to everything. But it was just one of those things where I felt like I had never really been a standout. I'd always been the guy that went to elementary school, played handball, had friends, you know, played Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh. But when middle school came around, all of a sudden, everything I did was put under a microscope. You know, if I maybe I didn't do well on a test, people would find out about that. Well, oh, like he's 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 really he's in the movie. Yeah, I heard he's like not smart at all. I heard he got like a B, a B minus on that test. Like, so when you go into high school, does it get worse or better? I will. I think because of that, I didn't go to high school. I went to independent high school. I still hung out with the friends that I went to uh, middle school with just because they were really the friends that I grew up with. And, and I'll tell you what, Barry, I, I met a lot of wonderful people in that homeschool program. Kind men, women, men, we were all kids. Um, but the thing that really was detrimental was hanging out with the people that I went to public school with because they never understood what I went through. And they, they uh, truthfully dumped their own insecurities onto me. First girl that actually gave you the time of day when everybody else was calling you wimpy. You remember who that was? I remember a bunch of them. And the sad part is that I probably pushed all of them away because of the way that I was treated by my friends in public school. See, it's interesting because in the homeschool program, they were all they either had parents that were artists or actors or in the industry, or they were aspiring artists and actors. And I was in this weird place where I was in one group, but then I was also in another group. And so they handle themselves and carry themselves very differently. I think, man, I don't know where I read this or where I heard this, but Billie Eilish, she said that if she went to public school and dressed in her baggy, like, giant clothing she would have been probably teased and bullied and i can't say she's wrong i think that hanging out with my public school friends i don't want to say it was the worst decision and i know my parents just wanted me to be normal which is why they insisted on that but in hindsight i would have just stuck with the path i had chosen which was hang out with the people that know what it's like to grow up around adults you know hang around the people that know what it's like to miss all your friends birthday parties because you're going on four auditions a week or filming on movie sets you know it's kind of like that's why i call it being an outsider is like it's 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 hard to go from working with adults being around adults and then traveling the world and then all of a sudden you're going to school and like i'm normal it's kind of like you're not normal and those experiences don't leave you. And so I almost like, in order to try to fit in with the public school crowd, I started to resent the gifts that I was given. I, I mean, what a gift to have a movie that people to this day 
come up to me on the street every day and tell me how grateful they are and how, I mean, think about how safe they feel around me. I mean, talk about a, I mean, truly the only word is gift. And I, I think I'm angry at myself because when I was younger and I'm not angry, I'm just upset that I let other people's insecurities and own stuff. That's why I'm so adamant on not dumping that on another person, whether that's a friend or a partner, because I felt like I got that my whole life and not from my parents. I mean, maybe a little bit, you know, we all have our relationship with our parents, but mostly from the kids I was around. They were mean, Barry. They were mean. And I'm not angry at them. I know that we were all young and we didn't know how to deal with things. But unfortunately, their insecurities became my insecurities. And then I dumped that on the people that were kind to me. So it was like the worst thing I did was try and fit in with both crowds. I wish I had chosen one. I think I leaned more towards the public school crowd, but I was never going to fit in. I was never going to fit in because of the choices I made that my parents made for me. And I wouldn't take back, but because I didn't understand them, I was too young. I didn't know who I was. And there's no how-to book. There's no real empathy for, you know, people who are child actors and what they have to give up. The only thing people look at is all the things you're going to get, the fame, the money, the attention. But there is a whole long laundry list of things that come with it. And it comes with being calculated. It comes with carrying yourself. It comes with having to be more sensitive to how other people feel. I mean, it's it's feel, it's it's almost like you are forced to grow up. You You genuinely are because of how people start treating you. And so there's no like... Maybe you close off. I know a lot of people cut off everyone and hide away. Or you do the opposite. You go party, you go hang out with everybody. And then, we're, you know, there's there's no right way. But people are really quick to to hate on the people that make the wrong decision, especially when they're, they're in the limelight. But that's not to say I'm not grateful. I am beyond grateful. I wouldn't tr change it. The only thing that was difficult was just like realizing that, oh, I'm not normal. And not because I am not. I am normal. It's just my job. But other people see me differently. And that's a blessing and a curse. One, because I have to be aware of that. That doesn't mean I am different. I'm not. I'm not better than them. But it also means that I have to treat it as something that needs to be handled with care. So if someone recognizes me, that's a blessing. They see me as the guy that they grew up with. I've never met them. So I have to know that going in and I have to go, okay, well, they trust me. So I need to respect this trust. I need to honor it. But then how do I also make sure I feel okay? Because I am Zach. I'm not, I'm not this character from X amount of projects I've done. You know, I mean, obviously I've done like 50, 60 things in my career and people recognize me from all different ones. And I feel like it's probably the same way when people watch YouTubers or vloggers or celebrities, you know, you feel like, you know, these people, I mean, I, I feel like I know everything about Justin Bieber's life. I've never met him. I don't know the guy. I can't have an opinion, but I know him. And if I met, I saw him on the street, it's like, I know things that I probably shouldn't know, but like, he doesn't know me. And that's something I have to remember. And I think a lot of people, uh, myself included, we forget that like, there's cons and pros to all of these decisions. I wouldn't take it back, but it's tough when you, you feel like, a, I've always felt like the lone wolf. And that doesn't mean there's more people that have been through it, but there's different scales, different levels. And it's hard to compare them. So Got it. I think that's where the, the self-conscious fear, anxiety really stems from is I really feel like nobody understands me. And that's not because people don't understand parts of me, but there are not many people on this planet that have been through what I've been through. And I'd also say Daniel Radcliffe even was on a more magnified level of what I've been through. So although I understand what he's been through, I don't understand what he's been through. That's me times 10. You know what I'm saying? So it's like one of these things where we all have the same. Th I have dreams of having a family. I want success. I want to hopefully afford a house one day. <laughs> Can they go down, please? Um, I have the same desires, passions, but for whatever reason, because of the career I've chosen and the path I've taken, the side effects are that people see me and treat me differently. And it's a blessing in so many ways. But that doesn't mean there aren't things about it that people don't talk about, don't want to talk about, and don't realize exist, especially when you're a kid. And that's why you see so many of these actors turn to drugs, turn to alcohol, go off the deep end. Maybe, you know, like that's what they feel like they have to do. Where's the empathy? How is Justin Bieber still alive? I don't know how he's still alive, genuinely. You know, where's the credit? Not a lot. I want to go way, way, way back. Take me back to where you grew up, 
what your family was like, what the economics were of the situation, and what was your inspiration to get into this crazy f***ed up business? Well, I have to say, first and foremost, I'm very lucky, not just because of the career that I've had, but God willing, my parents are still alive. They are the reason I was able to go after my dreams. Think about that. My mom had to travel with me and my dad had to stay at home, raise my other two brothers. That's tough on a marriage. That's tough on my brothers. Do they resent you? I think for a time they probably did, and I don't blame them. I could have. I was probably a little shit at times, you know? Do you have a better relationship with them now? Very much so. I, again, Barry, the twist of all this is when you feel like nobody understands you, and that, it's, it's not because people don't understand me, it's just that it's hard to. Um, I've really taken a lot of time with myself, and I've really had to figure out who I am, at least attempt to, how I can attain the things that I want, whether that's a relationship, a healthy one with my mom, with my dad, with my brothers, even with a partner, friends. It's allowed me to be a better brother, a better son. You know, to go, wow, was I grateful that my parents gave up so much to allow me to do what I wanted? Was I? Probably not. I, I remember when I was 13 to 18, all I wanted to do was get away from my parents. Probably was the Coogan account. That's what they were <laughs> accumulating so they could just spend it on the rent. And that's another thing. I'm lucky my parents didn't do that, you know? Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Coogan, uh, Jackie Coogan was a child actor long ago and got screwed over by his family. And so um, I believe it's the um, AFTRA and SAG put together a uh, law or a rule of the Jackie Coogan law. So all of... Uh, a young child's money, except for the agent's fee and the manager's fee, gets put in an account and saved there. So many child actors have more money than their parents have, and they are technically not allowed to touch it. They can't touch it at all. But then the, but sometimes they figure out a way to take a manager fee or do whatever it is and and get it. Yeah, I was very lucky. Very lucky. I mean, every year I get older, I also feel like I have more respect for my parents. You know? How tough it is being a parent. I mean, your kids drive you crazy. They don't appreciate you. You give up everything. You love them unconditionally. And no matter what they need, you're there for them. I'll tell you what, I don't even have a friend or a partner that's ever been there for me the way that my... And, and maybe that's because I haven't been there for those people either. But I'll tell you what, there's no love like a parent's. That's why I can't wait to have kids is because I just can't. I feel like the only thing I'm really going to love unconditionally, I'm hard enough on myself, but it's, it's, is my parents. I'm my parents. Well, my parents won, but my, my kids for sure. So keep going on that. So you're growing up and your environment is a normal middle class environment or, you know, how, what is it like and, and where, what's your inspiration for making it all happen or wanting to be an actor or wanting to audition? So I think that growing up, it was fairly normal besides the fact that I'd have to be taken out of school or my mom would pick me up immediately after school. We'd go straight to the gas station. But how did it get to that? You mean auditioning? Like how did it get to the fact that you said to your mom, I want to audition? Well, like I was saying, I, I feel like I always wanted to entertain. I liked attention when I was a kid. I know, but you have to have people who, who help you actualize your dream. <laughs> so apparently when I was a kid, I would be very precocious in grocery stores. Maybe I'd make a scene. I don't know the details. It's all a blur. But people would approach my mom and I and say, you got to put him in commercials or movies, whatever. You know, the typical, you know, call me. But Here's my card. But were they saying that to your brothers as well? As far as I know, no. I don't think my brothers liked attention as much as I did as a kid. Or maybe they were more self-conscious. I wasn't self-conscious at all as a kid. And so... I had a, a friend in elementary school that went to an acting class, and basically I was like, oh, I'll come with you one day. Apparently, I didn't even like it. Apparently, I called my dad and was like, hey, I don't like this acting class. Pick me up. But the teacher there sent in a photo of me for like an audition, like a breakdown, and they wanted to read me. And so we got a call and said, hey, like he's got an audition. You know, I know he's not in the class, whatever. Would you take him? It was for a movie called Because I Said So. So Diane Keaton and Mandy Moore. Wow. Uh, I, I literally, I literally, uh, I've only been to that 
complex twice for that audition and also for a, a show called the good doctor which i ended up i ended up getting that role like 10 years later which was crazy but um so I went in, I prepared all these jokes. I was this young eight-year-old kid trying to make them laugh. I mean, they probably thought I was adorable. Um, and I got a call back. I didn't get the role. But the kid who got the role was out of town for whatever reason. It was Thanksgiving. And they said, hey, can you come in for the read-through? So I went in for the read-through. I didn't get the role, but everyone there thought I was the son. And I just made them laugh. I was eating candy the whole time during the read-through with all these big actors and actresses. And by the end, Diane Keaton and who else? Mandy Moore. And and by, by the end of it, they're all like, "You're not in the movie." And I was like, "No, I'm just repl I'm here for the kid who who who's out of town." And they're like, "We got to write this kid a, a role." So they wrote me a, a a role in a bakery or something. I remember Diane Keaton was a sweetheart, and it got cut out. But from there on, I skipped everything. Uh, I didn't have to do any of the extra work. I got my SAG card. I got straight to the agent line. What's crazy is, actually, this is hilarious. I haven't thought of this story in a long time. I tried to get an agent before then, and I couldn't. I went to, they used to have open casting calls for agencies, and you would memorize like a a, a two-line bit. It was like, uh, Oscar Mayer makes the best <laughs> bologna sandwiches. I can eat them every day. Thanks, mom. Or like M&Ms, they melt in your mouth, but not in your hands. You know, like stuff like that. Those are literally two of the things that we had to memorize. And I know this because my mom said, say the Oscar Mayer one. And I said, no, I like M&Ms. I'm doing the M&M one. And they didn't hire me. But- I did this role. Well, I got this part in this I movie. I told you you should have done the album. And she was right. I should have said it. That would have been way better than the Eminem thing. And uh, after I got this role in this movie, I met with all these other agents. And that agent again, and I remember saying in the meeting, they were like, we'd love to work with you. And I was like, you know, I, I didn't even mean it in a bad way. I said, you know, before we say anything, we have like five other agents we're meeting with. So I just want to let you know that. So we'll, 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 we'll let you know. <laughs> that's what I said. And did you end up signing with them or somebody else? I didn't. I actually think I did sign with them uh, for like voiceover and stuff, I think. And then I actually ended up, my first voiceover audition I ended up getting. And the rest is history. Which is a lot of people don't realize about you. You're, you're massive in the voiceover world. You've done, you've probably done more things in the voiceover world than you have in anything else. But a lot of people don't understand how lucrative and how crazy it is and how many things people can do because you know let's face it grown adults aren't watching uh santa puppies or uh you know or or certain things that um are like instrumental in kids growing up or i remember i, I remember when i got the um can't believe this but what was it what's the train the famous train uh, thomas the train thomas the train so I remember I, I got the DVD long ago for my kids, Thomas the Train, and I pop it in. And it's like this this is the voice that's on there. It's this voice that I remember from this bit. Baseball is played on a field. Football is played on a gridiron. It was that voice, George Carlin. And George Carlin was the voice of Thomas the Train. I'm thinking to myself, holy sh**. You know, this guy was doing all this stuff. Nobody knew what he was doing. And he was making mailbox money. Yeah. Anyway, so so that's your inspiration. You get on the set. Things start going. They start rolling. Everything's great. Before I get into anything else, tell me when you decided that you're going to pursue music seriously. I think a segue into that as well is, ironically, the movie that we did together, I play a professional guitar player. So Was that a little nudge for you? I think what helped is, to answer your question, about five years ago, I'd always sang, but I really wanted to release my own music. I just felt like I could get better I could learn to play an instrument. I can't carry a piano around with me everywhere, so why not guitar? And what's really interesting about when the movie we did together, Max Dagan, I play Max, is that it was right around the time I was recording my first few songs to release. And so I'm finishing one of my songs and I get this audition to play a guitar player who's like 
cooler. You know, he, he's a little bit more tough. It's a more serious role. It came at the perfect time for me where I was at in my life and my career. And it gave me the nudge to say, I can do this. Actually, the, the skills that I've been honing the last few years playing guitar. Now, he's not a singer in the film, but I can do this. And so it was really a sign from the universe to say, you know, you've been doing guitar singing for like three, four years. You're on the right path. I've never gotten an audition ever in my entire almost 20 years now to play a musician, like someone who plays guitar in the film itself. And uh, actually, I, I did one role where it was already written in, but I, I'd already gotten the role. But um, never just like, I mean, I'm talking about a thousand auditions. Like we're talking over a thousand auditions, honestly, in my career. A thousand. Dude, I have been on, I remember Mark, uh, Mark Ruffalo said like, you keep going. It took me like 400 something auditions. I'm like, I'm like, Mark, I think I'm on 1,300 auditions, man. Uh, you got it easy. <laughs> so, um, wow. yeah, it's it's crazy. But um, it just goes to show you, you just got to keep sticking with it. The grind never does stop. And, yeah, you just have to keep moving forward. One, two, three, five, six, 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 six degrees of separation. Six degrees of separation. I'm going to mention some people. Sure. Tell me a word, a short sentence. Maybe it could be a little tiny, little inspirational thing or whatever. And anything that comes with it. Jane Fonda. She had the cutest dog. We worked on a movie called Georgia Rule, directed by Gary Marshall. The late Gary Marshall? Yeah. God bless him. I had the uh, honor of... Um, being the last person that interviewed him. <sighs> he really gave me my start. After the movie, Because I Said So, I went in for an audition for Georgia Rule. I got a call back at the Falcon Theater. That's where his office used to be. I went in, and before I read, I said, hey, everyone, I'm an eight, nine-year-old kid. My mom is such a big fan, Gary. Can I just bring my mom in, please? She'd love to meet you. <laughs> and he was a sweetheart, but... Jane Fonda, especially, she would always talk to my mom on set. She'd always talk to my mom and say, be careful, watch over him. Make sure he doesn't end up like one of these crazy people. First time I met Jane Fonda, I'm doing this show called The Telethon for America that I got a chance to executive produce. And we shot it at the YouTube, whatever it is, production studios. And YouTube is very progressive. Their bathrooms were just all stalls and then this long long sink for men and women so i just go in one of the stalls i you know go to the bathroom i come out there's a woman with her pants around her ankles and you know her panties on and her shirt and she's pulling her pants up and tucking her shirt and i just went up to the thing and i'm just like because I, I never met her before, and and she said, "What? What? You never seen a woman with her pants down?" I said, "I'm sorry. I didn't think that I would meet Jane you. Fonda." Yeah, I said, "I thought I didn't think I would wow. meet you for the first time like this." Wow. <laughs> I you might be the only person in the world with that story. I think I might be. Anyway, wow. Let me keep going. Nicholas Cage. <sighs> what an honor to work with him. I know you say sentences, but the moment you say things, they bring back memories I haven't thought of in forever. We were doing National Treasure 2 together. It makes you think of what a career I had when I was younger. I'm so grateful. We In between takes. What we, a career you have. Have. I know. I'm working on it. I feel like an old man, Barry. I feel like I'm nine at 125 years old. I know. But I've been around for so long. He, he and I were on set and we would play this game. I remember I learned it in elementary school called Slide. So I taught him how to play it. We'd slide our hands and we'd just do that back and forth. He was so kind. He was so gracious. He, he hung out with me on set. We talked. He answered questions. What an honor. One of my favorite actors still to this day. Michael Madsen. Legend. Legend. Which reminds me, I think he changed his number. I need to get his new number from you. Uh, he, he's a master at his craft. I, what a wealth of stories what a joy to be able to watch 
And he's one of the most authentic people I've ever met. Unapologetically himself. There's there's no fear. He's completely uninhibited. Say that again. There's no what? No fear. Could you say that one more time, please? No fear. Thank you. <laughs> George Lopez. George Lopez. Huh. It's funny is the coach, the acting coach on Wimpy Kid One was Belita Moreno. And she did the the George Lopez show for years. I actually remember, I think I went to one of George's birthday parties or something. Kind. Very kind to me. Yeah. I didn't talk with him much, but I mean, the guy, that that show used to be my thing. With my mom and I, we'd, we'd fall asleep to Nick at Night, the Lopez show, that low rider song playing. Bruce Dern. You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is he really believed in me, really believes in me. I haven't spoken to him in a couple of years, but. He was the first person that made me think I could be a real actor. When he was nominated for the Oscar for Nebraska, I remember I crashed one of uh, his screenings for the movie. There was a Q&A for SAG. And in the audience, someone said, hey, what's a film that you worked on with an actor? He had no idea I was here, by the way with an actor that you loved working with. I'm sitting in the audience, Barry, and he goes, you know, I just did this movie with this young guy, Zach Gordon, Zachary Gordon. The guy's the next Walter Matthau. <laughs> he's like, he's, he's so great. And I just stood up. I was like, I'm here, Bruce, <laughs> I'm here. And we caught up, we talked. I remember one time we, we met in Hollywood. We grabbed a Coke, you know, that's what he liked to call it, you know. Get a Coca-Cola. Guy's just a wealth of knowledge. I mean, one of the greats, right? He's worked with everybody. He worked with John Wayne. You and, that, know? and that's what I want you, if you take anything away from this interview, totally, you know, or in this audience is watching and whatever, but just, just if it's you alone in a soundproof booth, if you could take one thing away from this whole interview... Is it a man who worked with John Wayne all the way to, I think, 37 <laughs> Academy Award winning or nominated <laughs> actors? The guy in Coming Home who had that, I mean, that scene going into the water. I, I, I mean, one of the greatest actors of our generation singled you out saying that you were going to be the next Walter Matthau. And I just want to share with you something. Your memories of Walter Matthau are from roles when he was how old to how old? Old. That's right. So you have to understand that you're going to have like a 50, 60 year career and that when the guy who has worked with John f***ing Wayne and everywhere in between to the greatest actors won an Academy Award, right, says that you're somebody special, you're f***ing somebody special. You're not f***ing somebody special. You're somebody special. And you have to listen to the world about what the experts tell you. Don't listen to what some casting director who's had her salary cut 17 times and is frazzled because they want to find a certain person and she's losing her mind or he's losing their mind and trying to get the right person. Everybody's pulling them in different directions. Or are you going to listen to the person who's been there on the set gutting it out with other actors. I'm not saying casting directors aren't valid, important. They are. But they're overworked and underpaid. An actor has time to think about the people he's worked with. He has time to know who's great and who's not great. And uh, he singled you out. So just remember that.
Now I'm going to ask you this question. You're going to say, that was it. That was the answer to that question. No. Your proudest moment in show business. I can't. Genuinely, there's nothing that. This sounds like a cop out, but I feel like I'm still looking for it. I feel like. I haven't had it yet. That doesn't mean I'm not tremendously proud of the career I have. I'm still looking for it. Okay. You know, as it makes me feel, it's weird to say, makes me feel good is like, you know, when you're walking through an airport or you're running around or you're going somewhere, you're not paying much attention to anything or you're in a coffee shop and you're just doing your thing, whatever, and then all of a sudden you hear Zach. Zach. And you turn around and it, somebody who you respect and admire and you know that they could have seen you and just walked in the other direction and pretend that they didn't see you because they don't have to say hello to you why do they say hello to you because they feel safe and comfortable saying hello to you and they want to say hello to you and they're looking forward to it so those are the times for me like when i like will those are the moments for me that, that mean more than the bigger moments. Like when I'm in a Starbucks and <laughs> I'm to the Starbucks and I hear Catsy. Catsy. What the is going on? Over here. And then it's Sandler and you're like, oh, okay, I made the cut. I, uh, you know, I made the cut. He didn't have to stop me. You know, and God knows how many thousands of people don't say hello to me during the day and just go, oh, f that's cats. Let's get out of here. Let's get out the side door. But anyway, your uh, biggest disappointment in show business and how you used it to fuel yourself to the next level. Funny you say Sandler. I was in college. I was 18. 19, maybe. And... I was looking for a way to get out of college just because I felt like the same stuff I dealt with growing up seemed to always chase me, you know, people hating me, liking me for no reason, not knowing anything about me or thinking they know things about me, you know, it's just the story of my life. Not to say, don't feel bad for me. I'm just, it was something I, I had to learn to accept and navigate. So I was like, great. College is like high school and middle school all over again. So... I was up for this movie. It was on Netflix. I'm pretty sure Sandler's crew did it. I actually got the role. I think I met him at the read through, but I'll tell you, man, I, I bombed that table read. I, I was not funny. I wasn't hitting beats. And even the, the, actually the acting approach that I had at the time was completely inappropriate for the type of project we were making and that inappropriate in the sense that my technique was a complete hindrance to the movie we were making. It was a comedy. It was funny. It was like quick, you know, maybe there's some improv involved too, but I was like, the approach I had was say the line a certain way and don't steer off that path. And so they didn't want me in the project anymore. At the time, I really had a gut feeling. I was like, yeah, that did not go well. And that was not my best work and I was anxious. I mean, you look up to Adam Sandler, you know, David Spade's in the room, like I'm trying to leave college and prove to my parents that I don't need to stay for the next three years because I, I wasn't really excited about what I was studying and I felt cornered out again, right? Singled out, didn't feel like a fresh start. And so I had way too much pressure riding on my shoulders and they made the right choice in my opinion in removing from the project. That doesn't mean I wouldn't have done a good job, but I just, I didn't know what tools I needed at the time for that. And and did you go right out and watch the movie and uh, and see who was in it and see how they did? I, I actually don't think the movie did really well at all, honestly. Oh. I mean, I, I don't I don't like to have opinions about that stuff because based off of film success doesn't mean the film was good or bad, frankly. But did you, I don't even know what the movie was. No, I didn't, I don't, I don't even remember the name of it. But, but you see you didn't go watch it or anything? No, okay. no, not at all. Okay. Um, but what I will say is that led me to go, okay, how can I feel more confident in my technique? 
how can I be more prepared? And if I knew something was wrong and I didn't speak up, how do I adjust the next time? So I looked up acting techniques, read a bunch of books. I remember Bruce Dern always used to talk about Strasbourg. I think he studied under him. And I was like, oh, what's Meisner? What's this technique? And I did a two and a half year program and it changed my life, not just as an actor, but as a human being. And I feel like I always avoided technique and curriculum, even when I was younger, I didn't like school. And uh, I pushed through it and it was one of the best decisions I ever made and not getting that role, I should say losing that role, was huge for me because I would have carried on with, I don't wanna say bad technique, but not a real foundation on how to adapt, how to serve any project, not just the way that you've been doing things for X amount of years or what you think is right. And it's been so liberating and freeing. And I think it's why I'm able to perform it the way I do today and why I feel confident in the choices that I make as an actor. Now, granted, the only thing that slips as we've talked about is do people agree with my choices or do people see the work that goes into my choices? And most of the time, I think an actor has to be okay with that's probably not. Probably not, because the one thing that learning a technique made me realize is I never appreciated how much work goes into the greats. I always watched and went, they're great, but I didn't know why. Now, now I do. Awesome. Last question. What advice do you have for the young kid growing up in the regular neighborhood, you know, dancing the Michael Jackson when they're two, trying to figure out how to become a young actor and navigate through, get the roles and continue to get the roles and then become a man and then figure out how to be the greatest person you can and have the kind of career you're having. Basically what Barry just asked me to do is give myself advice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really simple. Work hard. And what do I mean by work hard? Don't be indecisive, make decisions, pick a technique, go to class, not just any class, learn a foundational technique. You could study Strasbourg. You could, I always say study the greats because they're the ones that really paved the way. You know who taught me that? Michael Madsen. And he's right. You watch the people that laid the foundation for us. No one's watching them today. And if anything, you'll stand out. And uh, I think have a deep, deep love and appreciation for the craft that we do and Answer the question, do you want to be famous? Do you want to be a good actor? Why? What do you need? What do you want? And that doesn't mean that if you want to be famous and win an Oscar isn't a valid goal. That doesn't mean that that's not something that you should strive for. I guarantee you, if that's your goal, it will change. But if it gets you in the door and it gets you motivated, go for it. Don't question it. What you need is just the passion and the discipline to go, okay, I'm going to study this because, you know, if most people would say they want to be famous, great. If it gets you in the door, it gets you to study your lines, it gets you to appreciate the craft, watch the greats, study them, ask questions, reach out to people that are doing what you want to do. If you have a friend that's on a set, if you have a friend that's doing extra work, climb the ladder, be nice to everybody because genuinely, first off, just be nice to everybody in general. We're all struggling. None of us are perfect. You know, like even the people that I, I, I would, I don't even look up to the people that are like genuinely winning Oscars right now and going through all this stuff because I know what my challenges are like. I can only imagine what theirs are with relationships, friends, money, just because you have money doesn't mean that life is great. I mean, it opens up more people wanting money from you, people expecting things from you, people stealing money from you, making the wrong investments, losing all that money. And then now you think, what do people think of me? I mean, it's just like why lottery winners, 70% of them I heard like go broke within the first couple of years. So it's, it's just all these things. Look, I'm going to, sorry, I said simple, but I went on a tangent. Study, work hard, invest your money. Because the number one reason why people can't afford to be an actor is they can't afford it. And this is not the business for money starting off. It will if you continue to put the work in. Uh, hang around people that want to get better. Also, I hate to say it, but this is just the world we're living in and I'm trying to navigate it myself. Social media. You can hate it, but you have to respect it. It's an opportunity, one, to actually support yourself if you need other ways to supplement your income. But also... We live in a time where people want to see the result. They want to see that you can do what they're casting you for. They want to see that you've already done it. 
I'm not saying people don't take risks, but I feel like we can all say that risks risks are a lot different than they once were. You know, I feel like a couple, even like 10, 15 years ago, people would take a risk on a director who maybe hadn't really done anything, but you know, there was something about him that was special. I feel like today you need to have at least bare minimum, a short film, bare minimum, but also usually a couple of films under your belt, you know, or some other quotas. Uh, and then the last thing is don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up because I, I spent most of my career doing that. And uh, I'm catching up now, realizing that it's not too late for me. <laughs> I'm still very young. It only doesn't feel that way because I've been doing this for so long. Uh, don't get jaded. Don't get beaten down. Love what you do. Uh, forget the result. And if you keep getting better and you keep making films with friends, putting out things that are comedic or show off your skills, that's why I'm doing music. You know, no one knows I do music. No one knows I sing. And I'm hoping that I can find a way to merge the two. But again, just to say, if you're a young director trying to get a film off the ground, I need to show people that I can do it. They're not just going to believe that I can do it. You know, I'm not like, I'm not like Mark Wahlberg. I go in a meeting and say, you know what? I want to do a movie where I can sing and I can, and they'll be like, great, here's 20 million. I have to make the film. I have to make the music. I have to build the audience and I'm probably going to be better for it. So it takes work, but who wants the easy path? I know I do, but really do I? As I've gotten older, no, I don't. I didn't get here because it was easy. I'm, I've stayed here because I've just continued to endure. And I think that's the final word is endure. Sag Gordon, extraordinary, my friend. Always an honor. Thank you so much. Great job.